Good evening. My name is Sarah Rahman Sheikh and I am an English honor student of Rani Billa Girls College under Calcutta University. I welcome you to the stories of tribal identity and culture that will explore the role of tribal art and tribal representation in art in shaping cultural identity and ideology curated under TMYS Review June 2024 in collaboration with the Center for Asia Pacific Initiatives, University of Victoria. We are also calling for the submission of essays, poems, and short stories under the project. To know more about the submission guidelines and the project architecture, please visit www.tellmeyourstory.biz. This evening, I consider myself very privileged to be in the company of our esteemed panelist, Dr. Shorov Banerjee, Dr. Amit Soni, Professor Purbo Shaha, who will soon join, and Professor Pawan Toppo who will shortly share their views and insights with us. The topic for today's discussion is misrepresentation and stereotyping of tribal communities in art under the sub-theme tribal representation in art. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker for the session is uh, Dr. Shorov Banerjee. Dr. Shorov Banerjee is an associate professor and head of the Department of English uh, of a government-sponsored college affiliated to the University of Calcutta. He is an education ambassador of the International Organization of Educators and Researchers Incorporated, Philippines, a member of the International Advisory Board of uh, the book series titled Post Humanities and Citizenship Futures of Roman and Littlefield, and editorial board member of Asia Pacific Journal of Advanced Education and Technology. We are delighted to have you on the panel, sir. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, our, uh, our second speaker for the session is uh, Dr. Amit Soni. Dr. Amit Soni is presently Associate Professor in Department of Musology under Faculty of Tribal Studies in Indira Gandhi National Tribal University, Amar Kantak in Madhya Pradesh. He did his PhD on the topic Baiga Culture and Anthropomusological Study. He has wide experience of working in museums and exhibition projects in various parts of India, along with anthropological research, especially in tribal arena. He has also worked as Vice President of Museums, Association of India, and member of editorial board of few reputed journals. He is Editor-in-Chief of Indian Journal of Research in Anthropology. We are delighted to have you on the panel, sir. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, Hopefully he comes soon. He is facing some technical uh, issues. Uh, now yeah. I would like to request our uh, third speaker, uh, Pawan, Professor Pawan Topo. Now, Mr. Pawan Topo is an assistant professor in the Department of English at Shukanto Madhavi, Madhavidyalaya Dhup Guri in West Bengal. He has received a Dr. B.R. Ambedkar Shriti Medha Puroshkar in 2011 by Government of West Bengal. Nehru Award 2011 by T Board of India for his meritorious performance in Madhyamik Pariksha and gold medal in MA. His research interest in Adivasi festivals, performing traditions and identity formation in Duars region of West Bengal. He also observes and works on Adivasi studies, folk studies, new critical humanities, Finn studies, and etc. We are delighted to have you on the panel, sir. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for such a wonderful, uh, warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, now, our fourth speaker, who is soon to come, uh, is Professor Apurbo Shaha, former H of, uh, head of the Department of English and coordinator of Center for Endangered Languages and the Sindhu Kanhu Birsha University, Purulia, in West Bengal. He is also an honorary professor and advisor center for language and cultural studies, Green University of Bangladesh, Dhaka. He is widely published in national and international journals. His book titled Cultural Aspirations of Future India of Vivekananda and Tagore has been translated into five major European languages. He serves as associate editor for the International Journal of Humanities, published from USA. He is in the editorial board of many national and international journals. His research interests are linguistic and phonetics, endangered languages, folk culture, and literature. 
Now, uh, I would like to proceed uh, uh, with the session. Now, I would uh, like to request Dr. Shorov ben Banerjee to share his insights on the particular topic. Sir, over to you now. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And a very uh, good evening to my co-panelists and uh, the viewers who are watching live and will join us later. We'll catch it later in the recording. So, like, uh, the topic is misrepresentation and stereotyping of tribal communities in art. So uh, I will begin with very basic things, and I will uh, obviously, uh, at the risk of oversimplifying, I'll start by saying, defining, trying to define what a tribe is. So I'll say that the definition is of a tribe is a group of people who live and work together in a shared geographical area. A tribe has a common culture, uh, dialect, and religion. They also have a strong sense of unity. The tribe is usually headed by a chief. Uh, a tribal society is a group of tribes organized around kinships. Now, Raymond Williams had pointed out that there are two kinds of culture that are very different from each other. Culture as art and culture as a way of life. Now, he illustrated this difference by showing us that the culture of the British working class movement uh, was more uh, a matter of its political institutions, like uh, let's say trade unions and labor parties and the like, rather than its poetry and paintings. Again, Benedict Anderson, in his definitive book about the concept of nation and nationalisms uh, called Imagine Communities, had said that in the anthropological sense, a nation may be defined as an, uh, quote, an imagined political community, unquote, and imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign. Now, Anderson's claim is that all communities larger than primordial villages of face-to-face -face contact are imagined. Now, the tribal community, as I understand it, is perhaps the only community that makes culture as art and culture as a way of life coincide. And it is truly a nation without having to be imagined by anyone. So that is the definition that I want to uh, begin with. And now uh, coming to tribal art, it is the visual art uh, and material culture of the indigenous people, also known as non-Westerner art or ethnographic art or controversially primitive art. Tribal art have historically been collected by Western anthropologists, private collectors, and museums, particularly ethnographic and natural history museums. The term primitive is criticized as being Eurocentric and prerogative, definitely true. Talking of misrepresentation and stereotyping of tribal communities in art, there has long been a troubled history of relations between art and the tribal people uh, that they profess to represent. So uh, the 1984 exhibition called Primitivism in 20th Century Art, Affinities of the Tribal and Modern at the, modern, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, is a textbook example of how a good intention had gone wrong in the art world. This exhibition shows uh, the unconscious or subconscious stereotyping that happens when attempting to put together an exhibition without consulting or truly understanding those whose culture we are trying to represent or exemplify. One a major critique of primitivism exhibition was its failure to contextualize the art it was displaying an oversight which critics, uh, art critics like Thomas McEvely, called an act of appropriation, an example of how the museum pretends to confront the third world, so as to say, while really co opting it and using it to consolidate Western notions of quality and feelings of superiority. Now, other museums also display a lack of depth in their representation of tribals um, who are the copious others that they term. Now, uh, today, what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll uh, be uh, revolving closer around home and I'll be looking at the Gonda, the Gonda art form that came in as a form of resistance from the Madhubani Dalit, uh, as a form of resistance against the Madhubani painting by the Dalit Tushad women from being misrepresented. So Gonda, uh, Sarah, if you have the slides ready, uh, yeah. just uh, can you just display the first slide? So, yeah, hopefully Gonda, it's uh, showing. Uh, the, no, it is not. Uh, 
So let yeah, me just I continue. Yes, it is. Let me I just continue. Yes. Yeah. So. yeah, it is. It is. It is showing. So yeah, Gonda yeah, the fine art of now. tattoo painting. Yeah, thank you. So uh, Gonda the fine art of tattoo painting is practiced by Dalit Dushad women. Uh, Gonda art with its approach, raw material, and themes is distinct from the better known Mithila or more accurately Madhubani style, which mostly features Hindu deities in vibrant colors and is traditionally done by the Brahmin women of this region. The Gonda, meaning ritual tattoo art, paintings are distinctly different. They are mostly black and white and crafted by Dalit Dushad women of the area, as you can see in the picture. The themes center around nature, daily lives of the community of Dalit deities. Gonda is done on handmade paper crafted from gober. The gober is cow dung. So, uh, though traditionally this art was created on walls and ceilings of homes. Uh, a daughter of the renowned Gonda artist Lalita Devi lived and studied in Delhi and was always surrounded by the art form, but was oblivious to her identity as a Dalit Dushad woman. So when she was visiting home and she asked her mother, Lalita Devi, a state awardee that is, why she, that is Lalita Devi, had tattoos all over her body while she had none, Lalita Devi replied that it was Rinku Devi's privilege that she did not have to get the tattoos. Historical evidences show that the British marked prisoners with tattoos to identify them as criminals, creating a stigma around the Gond, or Gonda. So we see that besides its prevalence as a cultural practice, tattooing was also used as a method of torture by the state. In fact, the word used for tattooing, Gonda, to prick, puncture, dot, or mark, came to mean the marking of prisoners during the British Raj. And we can say on the authority of the Ambedkar University research, uh, researcher Sarah Huck's paper titled The Skin and the Ink, Tracing the Boundaries of Tattoo Art in India, that the prisoners' foreheads were tattooed as a method of identification. Criminals were branded by tattooing, often with the word thug on their foreheads. Now, the tattoo marks led to much social stigma of the convicts as they were easily identifiable by their tattoo marks in the public. I am reminded of the famous movie uh, where Amitabh Bachchan's hand uh, had this tattoo. Mera Baap Chor Hai. Remember? That was so almost like that. It's a melodramatic oversimplification of that. So in, in, in popular media, culture, and writings, Gonda has always been erased and even more invisible are the Dalit Dushad women who are skilled in this art form. Historians and academics writing about Gonda describe art as Harijan paintings, which is both derogatory and a misrepresentation. Often the women have been referred to as local artists, completely erasing the Dushad identity and the origins of a distinct art form uh, as a form of resistance against the Brahminical province and practice of Mithila paintings. Now, uh, can you can you change the slide, please, Sarah? So coming to the origin of this story, Jitwarpur. Jitwarpur is the center of Gonda painting. And according to oral narratives of its artists, the art form originated sometimes in the 1970s when two women, Zahida and Chano Devi, started painting in the tattoo form on paper or canvas. Now, traditionally, this art was mostly done on walls during festivals and or other celebrations. Zahida, a Natin, that is the tribal community which used to do tattoo all over the body, taught the art to Chano Devi, who then introduced it to the other women of Jitwar. Chano Devi insisted that women learn this art to become independent. And you can see the, the, the Dushad women artists in Chano Devi's, late Chano Devi's home. Now, Dushad women have used Gonda art to assert their community identity and the art form and save them from misrepresentation. The more popular Mithila paintings are centered on the life stories of Ram, Sita, and other Hindu gods. But other styles have existed alongside it, and Gonda is one such. But after the Mithila paintings, had been discovered and received support from the government and became popular and economically viable since the 1930s, it has been dominated since then by the upper caste Brahmin men and women. Dalit Dushad women were not only left out of government patronage, but also prohibited from drawing images of Ram, Sita, and other gods of the Savarna culture and Khobar, wall paintings with symbols of marital harmony and fertility. Now, this erasure can be seen in contemporary times when during the beautification of the Madhubani railway station, Mithila art found space, but not Gonda. Gonda art is rooted in the Spartan everyday lives of the Dalit Dushad women. 
they first craft handmade sheets of cloth or paper and then wash these with a mix of gober that is cow dung gond which is glue and water for colors they use dyes extracted from flowers leaves and kajal or kholi now gonda art is rooted in the very experience of segregation women artists of jitwarpur village revealed uh, that the upper caste brahmins would assert that ram and sita were their gods and the dushad people did not have the right to paint or sell them and even ask them to make their own gods and scared them off by asserting that they would be struck by misfortune if they painted the gods of the brahmins now the sad women were also prevented from painting some uh, forms of the sub forms of the mithila art like the bharni and the uh, other forms and they were told that these tantric paintings and bharni paintings would only be drawn by certain people from the upper caste with quote unquote magical powers since then the dushad women started their own version of the gonda art they shifted from drawing motifs from nature and daily lives to painting their local deities like shailesha chauharmal rahu and others uh, through this assertiveness or though this assertiveness brought new found fame as well as dignity to the lives of the dushad women artists yet it has also meant that this art is beginning to be appropriated by those from outside the dushad community and even though the dushad women have now found the opportunity to showcase their art in traditional international platform oh, sorry not traditional international platforms uh, they are still discriminated against because of their lower status and they allege they have that they have been at times misrepresented as dyans or witches now uh, talking in general the tribal communities share a close relationship with nature jal jungle and zameen that is water forest and land have fostered adivasis since time immemorial and adivasis have in return protected it they have been always they have always viewed they have always been viewed as the other with the need of being incorporated into the civilized and progressive world fervor and strong approbation towards their religious views cultural and social systems are seen as resentment towards modernization and as being anti national i'll i'll go into a bit of theory again uh, cultural theorist stuart hall in his book representation cultural representations and signifying practices observes that sounds words notes gestures expressions clothes are part of our natural and material world they don't have any clear meaning in themselves rather they are vehicles of media which carry meanings because they operate as symbols which stand for or let's say represent or symbolize the meanings which we wish to communicate a close look at the non adivasi imperative to define its other may reveal homogenization of adivasi communities due to which their different particularities are completely lost uh, what then constitutes the features of this standardized other is often more than the normative consciousness the word tribe can mean different things to different people therefore there is a creation of a, a stereotype which defines it But this stereotype can be the creation of a human mind which is the result of one's imagination or influence or other stereotypes or myths maybe so accordingly the dushad people i was talking about are seen by many as dalits and thereby not purely tribal but some see them but some see the dalits also as being tribals or adivasis adivasis had been part of books movies and television shows and are often subjected to either eroticism or a stereotype as jungle that is white people living in the jungles they are portrayed as speaking gibberish which is passed off as tribal language sara can we move on to the next slide please a uh, weird yes. set of actions and movements a weird set of actions and movements is passed off as tribal dance acceptance and normalization of such depiction is nothing but a cultural backlash uh, to the adivasi and tribal communities which constitute about 9% of the con uh, country's population now uh, if you look at this picture this is from uh, this is from a tele series called jimna where a tribal woman is represented as talking gibberish and that is passed off as tribal language but look at her dress she has been westernized look at her eyeliner on both sides of the eye and the hair do and the makeup nothing tribal but she is in her language and gestures tribal okay so uh next slide please and uh, another major presentation and stereotyping of tribal art inevitably happens when targeted tours are organized to see what tribals or adivasis look like and entails a live adivasi dance performance uh, that has little to do with the actual development of the region 
Now, this picture that I'm showing you is from Shonajuri Heart. It is in Soi Mela in Shantiniketan, which is supposed to showcase tribal handicrafts and, and a live tribal dance. So people go there, and it has been commercialized, uh, as you can see. So uh, tribal tourism is nothing more than a, a, a symptom of the mistaken belief that we are somehow bettering indigenous communities through the imposition of monetary systems and the introduction of Western communities. It is another classic example of misrepresentation and stereotyping of tribal communities in the art. And, and can, you, can you move on to the next slide, please, Sarah? Uh, I will end with this slide. I'll just talk a little bit. So if you see this, if I, 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 I don't know if you can read it. If you can read it, this is a set of instructions given in the Jarwa area in, uh, in, in the Andaman Islands. And if you closely follow it, the way the people have been asked not to interact or uh, talk or uh, kind of pick up the Adivasis or the tribals there in their jeep is very sad. It is like as if they are live shows like the wild animals of that place. So this has to stop. This has to stop. And this is the worst way of stereotyping and misrepresenting the tribals. With that, I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you for the patient hearing. Beautiful, sir. Uh it is a great, uh, insightful observation, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, now I would uh, request Dr. Amit Shoni to share his uh, observation, sir. Over to you now. Um, I must thank you, uh, Sara, and this platform for giving me opportunity. And uh, before me, Dr. Saurav has very well explained his experience uh, with uh, the modern uh, media also. Uh, I would like to uh, focus on the point that how the things are changing tribal art, actually, how it is marketized and uh, due to the impact of marketization, how things are changing and what was the previous condition and now what they are doing to cope up with the current needs of the market. So here I would like to give you examples also of uh, from Central India, from Northeast India, from Southern India tribal communities, even from the African tribal communities, or you can say we can also see the tribal communities from Australia or Mesoamerica. So what is happening actually, actually how these things started, I must say that these things started looking at these uh, uh, tribal groups because tribe term tribe itself it is a very controversial term actually actually it was given to the communities by the colonizers and in the colonizing phase the, because europeans europeans called it means the groups which they are the area where they are occupying the people living in the colonies they called them tribe okay so uh, the very thing which the Europeans uh, means even the ethnography, ethnography was uh, defined as the study of uh, non-Western countries or non-Western communities. So now how the things are changing now in the decolonization phase, uh, we are looking at our culture from our own eyes, the culture uh, from our own uh, uh, system. So. In this way, what is happening, uh, a good many things are changing, a good many perspectives are changing, even about the tribal art. Um, as you can see, uh, our tribal communities are quite egalitarian communities, but uh, even if you see, uh, means both men and women are equal, but if you see the painting of a tribal girl, or usually they've tried to focus on the tribal girls, so what they found there, the means I must say what they found, if you see the previous paintings, as uh, Saurabh was saying about Jarva or uh, you can say about Bondo in Odisha, you will, uh, they were more interested in making their naked paintings, naked photographs. So these were the things which the Western uh, artists were depicting. These were the things which the Western artists were depicting in their art form instead of depicting their, the beauty of their culture. Even uh, if you see in the various paintings made uh, during that colonial, uh, colonial phase or even after that, uh, much emphasis was given over uh, means uh, portrait, 
but if you see the tribal paintings made by the tribals they don't make portraits they make landscapes basically the tribal paintings are landscapes or they depict their uh, folk tales in those in their paintings or their god goddesses if you take the case of saura saura paintings usually the saura paintings are made by the priest saura priest because it is related with their magico religious practice magico religious practice of pleasing the god of make a doing treatment of uh, the uh, ill person so in this way and even if you see uh, among the sauras both the male and female can be priest and both of them equally have e have equal right of making those uh, sacred paintings saura paintings and for the purpose of treatment if similarly but if you see the case of uh, gon paintings actually so even if you see in the gon paintings in central india there is must much differentiation in the gon paintings uh, of different areas if you go to the bastar you will find two kind of gon paintings one is of, of gotul painting of murya gon and second one you will find uh, lakshmi jagar painting which you will find in the house of dhurwals again a subgroup of gon similarly if you come up here in the uh, madhya pradesh area means patangad patangad is very much famous for gon paintings the modern gon paintings which never existed before means few decades before this was never existed this was promoted by ms swaminathan by uh, bharat bhavan bhopal when jangar singh sham was given opportunity to participate in one of the festival tribal festival to portray tribal art so in this way the tribal art was modernized even though the themes shown in that gon painting are their original folk themes folk uh, means folk tales or their day to day life but you will find this painting is totally new this is renovated this was actually created and this was not the actual gon painting which was existing before you can say 3 or 4 decades before uh, actually they were making digna digna was their original gon painting style in the central india done by the pradhan gons but now they are doing modern painting uh, though they have made it an identity nowadays it is given giving income to them income to the artist this this is much popular but this is not the traditional gon painting so you can see the paintings even the painting art and even what they are depicting in these paintings the themes are changing one workshop i remember was organized organized by uh, igrms indira gandhi national uh, rashtri manav sangrahalay to know about the various motifs they make in their paintings so uh, they made different uh, short of motifs means motifs for air motifs for fire motifs for different 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 things but those motifs were not the their traditional motifs they created new motifs for depicting different things so this was the artistic imagination but usually if you find if you connect the tribal or folk paintings they have their own typical way of doing those paintings like mithila painting or madhubani painting or saura painting or varli painting or gon painting or any short of painting means if you see the most of the even in the baga houses they were in earlier days they were doing painting actually bagas are similarly famous for their tattooing tattoo marks on uh, bagin means baga woman's body because from head means their forehead to their toe they uh, do uh, carry the godna except their uh, means private parts all over uh, body parts which are visible uh, they uh, make godna but this godna is not actually done by the bagas this is done by their neighboring service community which are known as badi the badi budmain or badni uh, they are actually the local term is badnin so badnins do these kind of painting so uh, this uh, kind of a godna so they have their different tattoo marks specific tattoo marks means bela akhi or your peacock 
or different means uh, machli kata machli kata means your uh, fish skeleton actually they make so these kind of designs which are inspired by the nature or the surrounding things they made used to make this thing even the godna is also a means of healing means they used to add few forest herbs for uh, while doing godna for healing the person means if that woman have some problem so for healing or was also some godna part is done so you see the things the tribal art actually is much uh, you can say utilitarian kind of art or you can say that is close to their lifestyle their that is close to their uh, means way of living that is close to their culture that is close to the forest the ecology around them and uh, that is very much inspired that's why you will never found a single portrait the portrait form in indian tribal art especially in the middle, middle india even if you see the worldly paintings or the sora paintings where god and goddesses are depicted is here there is no differentiation between portraying a god or a goddess usually they sometimes they use the symbolic form also a trident is used to, in santhal to show the deity they make this painting this trident shape in their uh, you can say the greenery also the, because every house is a greenery so they make this trident symbol in their greenery also as a symbol of uh, annapurna or their local deity you can say they worship it so uh, the as in uh, uh, you can see the buddha dev buddha dev is the highest deity and uh, which is depicted uh, equally in the uh, tribes of central india similarly the uh, shakti cult is also depicted in the tribal communities a uh, few scholars have quoted that buddha dev is they have compared buddha dev with the highest god shiva so they say because as the buddha dev is also considered in the form of a ling uh, even the lingo pain hai na because pain is a god lingo is the god so lingo pain in gondi in bastar they call lingo pain buddha dev is also there but they call lingo pain also so somehow the you can see the relationship with, with the ancient uh, hindu tradition also there is a mingling also because uh, the tribals and non tribals were living in the same area same geographical area so it is obvious that they have have sort of interchanging or some sort of connection between their cultures so similar kind of concepts were depicted even in their history the origin means if you see the origin of baga tribe the form of naga baga or naga bagin actually so you will find the same history of coming out of the earth from the water as you will find the in the hindu mythology so these things are depicted in their paintings also when they when the four uh, these uh, gold paintings or baga paintings they they depict all these things but their earlier form the uh, the basic motto of their painting it was the decoration of their house or the tattoo was the decoration of their body because uh, means this this was the way this was the cheapest way or the easiest way to depict their beauty the depict the beauty of their culture or depict the or to depict the beauty of their surrounding nature so they have equally given weightes to the male uh, side and to the female side also because usually we see the tribal uh, communities are egalitarian they, they do not have much differentiation though with the changing time few differentiation are coming by the uh, coming through the uh, neighboring caste communities among them but uh, they uh, actually depict their surrounding or equality in their art forms how you commerce commercialization to this case if we see the commercialization what is is given on the sellability in the market the painting are made for selling in the market so what is happening 
what we are depicting even in the uh, in the tv shows as sort of as uh, shown that what we are uh, uh, depicting which is saleable which is our concept our notion of a tribe not the notion of the tribal communities means we are seeing them in the leafy clothes made of leaves hai na or with the feathers or with the bow and arrow with spear head but this is not like this they are using internet they are having the mobile accessibility nowadays they are developed you will find a quite developed means gond santhal meena in the rajasthan these are quite developed uh, tribal communities a good number of persons are working in on very high positions many good number of businessmen are there so you cannot imagine that every community is a pvtg or particularly vulnerable tribal group in india these are around only 75 okay so uh, here i must say what is happening that uh, they have now uh, commercialized their or this is the means of uh, the art forms become the means of livelihood for them so you will find the the craft factory you will find the craft factory even there you will find that uh, if you go to the bastar in konda gaon you will find the bell metal factory so their uh, tribal art which was actually made by the garhwa community garhwa is a caste community who was making bell metal idols dt idols for gonds so now that is popularized as the uh, you can say uh, tribal art or tribal figurines but now these art forms are made in factories in konda gaon in bastar so this is the commercialization this is because the due to the uh, great uh, means huge demand these uh, the things are changing even the motifs and symbols which are now depicted in these art forms are even changing because even if you see i give you one example that the tribal dances dance forms were quite rhythmic they were doing it with very ease sometimes they were stopping sometimes they were doing but for the sake of stage performances they have enhanced the speed they have maintained the rhythm they have started uh, performing in a means uh, you can say uh, for showing to the public means they are not enjoying it now they are just performing on the stage so this is how the tribal art is changing with time even if you go to the gond painting in the form of burial means memorial pillars in bastar because uh, the bison horn maria actually known as dandami maria they may uh, they erect uh, memorial pillars in the memory of their ancestors so in these memorial pillars what they depict they depict uh, means usually the memory is the uh, painting in the in the memory of the dead ancestors means uh, the nature or the personality of the dead is ancestors ancestor not the uh, you can say any different uh, means uh, but uh, but now what is happening they are making these memorial pillars in the form of aeroplane in the form of car with a concrete structure so you can see the things are changing with time uh if the time persist i can show you few photographs of uh, means if time persist then i can show few photographs of the uh, means uh, gond paint a uh, uh, memorial pillars made in bastar i would really like that so but unfortunately we only have 10 minutes it's really yeah, an yeah. unfortunate thing I, but it yeah. like i think our explanation was so wonderful and extremely fascinating educational it's really an mm. unfortunate that you know we cannot present that due to the time constraint okay 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 thank you uh, extremely sorry sir yeah 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 because but, i know we yeah. have third speaker also hai na he is mm. also waiting so uh, yeah at the time Thank of you. our is uh, yeah. means after if we get some time means uh, after uh, the discussion point then i can show at that time also yeah sure sure sir sure sir okay. now i think okay. i would uh, like professor pawan tappur uh, thank you so much for your observation your great observation and now i would like to re uh, request professor pawan tappur to share his 
observation on this particular topic. So over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, TMYS and the entire team for giving me this opportunity. It's an honor to be a speaker of this panel. So uh, already the two panelists has already discussed so many things. So I would like to start my, uh, my presentation by giving a little background of my research. I would start with the colonial notion of the tribe. Uh, in the Western or in, in the Western or the European epistemology, uh, the tribe in the Indian context was based on othering, the binaries of superior and inferior. It considered the oral societies as being devoid of the histories while they portray their history in a different way. In the colonial ethnographies, tribes were seen not being as a part of civilization, thereby, uh, thereby going outside the structure of larger Indian society. They were seen in constant interaction with the so-called civilization and uh, thereby going through the process of acculturation. And the acculturation has been studied in terms of tribes getting absorbed into the uh, society and becoming caste, peasant class, and so on. And with such a conceptualization, as Virginia's Khaka argues, the identity of an ethnic community like Urang uh, is indeed put at risk. The Chotnakur Petu was the main inhibiting land of the Urangs, from where they have migrated to the uh, tea gardens of Duarts region, which consist of Alipur, Duar, Jalbaiguri, uh, Kujbihar. Um, of West Bengal and uh, Bongaigao Kokrajahar district of Assam. Now, uh, this migration was not just a physical movement, but it was a process of drifting away from the socio-cultural features that gave them identity. Uh, the existing colonial narratives on the Udaos have refused to acknowledge the cultural differences and have uh, misrepresented as well as stigmatized their identity, quote unquote tribal identity, as uh, primitive, uncivilized, isolated, uh, barbaric, backward, and so on. So uh, Professor Das Gupta presents two ways to explore such corrupted narratives. One is based on simply uh, unpacking the uh, colonial archives, and other one is of a communitarian initiative in which we have to explore the uh, oral narratives. Um, as uh, critical, uh, new critical humanities, uh, one of the theorists, D. Venkat Rao, he claims that if culture is what we do and what we or others say about uh, what we do, our practices and our experiences, then uh, Uram culture, in a sense, has been represented by what colonial ethnographers have said about them. And the, so Adivasi studies must encounter this epistemology from outside and develop an epistemology with a perspective from within. In this regard, Cultural performances such as festivals, rituals of the Urals uh, serve as a form of resistance to protect their distinct identity. The oral narratives of these performances can be interpreted as an opposition or an argument against the colonial narratives, which helps them to uh, re-articulate their Adivasi identity. So here I'll be trying to look into the relationship between the festival performance and the identity formation uh, with specific with reference to the Urals of Duarts region. And uh, I will also try to look at uh, how festival and the ritual performance help them to re-articulate their Adivasi identity. We all know that festival is a community event in which a particular um, community take part. Uh, um, it marks the historical and cultural events of a particular community by bringing the historical and cultural events, while the rituals represent the traditional customs um, and uh, other aspects of their culture. So Urao uh, celebrates various festivals throughout the year. One of the festival is Sarhul festival that is celebrated in the month of Chetra uh, in the March and April. This festival in Kuduk language, which is the mother tongue of the Urao, is known as uh, Khaddi or Khekel Venja, which literally means marriage of the earth. In this festival, they, they, they believe that the earth is married with the sun. And uh, according to the belief system, this marriage ultimately leads to the fertility of the earth. Uh, they, they are aware of the relationship between the heat of the sun and the fertility of the earth. And they, in fact, perform a ritualistic marriage between Pahan, representing sun, and Pahanian, representing earth. And uh, the celebration of the festival is not limited within this. It also signifies the arrival of the new year or the new season, as uh, during this season we see uh, 
the new born natural organisms as this is the time when nature starts to bloom itself with the new flowers uh, as well as new leaves so in a sense urao as a community may not be aware of the photosynthesis or the um, chemical process of the photosynthesis but uh, they knew uh, under their uh, indigenous knowledge system for life soil earth and air is very much important and another interesting aspect of the festival is uh, weather forecasting uh, by observing the level of water in the picture which they put before the festival day they try to forecast the weather of the upcoming season it depends on the level of water uh, if the water level remains same in the picture which they have put in the last day uh, it will be assumed that there will be an abundant of water uh, rainfall in the upcoming season while uh, the water level decreases it will be indicative of the scarcity of rainfall um, in the upcoming season and this is one of the interesting observation that some scholars have observed uh, as well as claimed that this is uh, illogical or uh, uh, superstitious but there is a science behind this the scientific explanation is that the rainfall in the upcoming season de uh, depends on the humidity that is existing in the year the humidity of the high humidity in the year actually causes less observation of the water in the picture while if in the in the if in the year if the humidity remains low it will it will consume much more water in the picture so the humidity in the year is actually indicative of the rainfall in the upcoming season so i will be moving to the another festival that is the karam festival celebrated by the uraus this festival uh, is indicative of their indigenous identity as this festival represents um, the idea of fertility fecundity um, and productivity and this idea is not only uh, is not limited within uh, the community itself but it also towards the regeneration of the crops so in one sense it highlights the regeneration of their community as well as the regeneration of the crops of the field the problem comes uh, while uh, this uh, festivals got misrepresented by the scholars like in the earlier studies karam has been wrongly interpreted um, in its significance and claimed this uh, as it's borrowed from different neighboring communities without giving proper evidence for example there are many scholars who assume that this festival has been borrowed from the neighboring uh, hindu or semi hindu communities while there are some other scholars like wg archer who claims in fact who finds its affinity with the christmas so it's very much evident that uh, the festival has not been seen as a part of urao culture while some scholars claim it is borrowed from hindu neighbor while some claims its affinity with the christmas no effort has been made to understand its importance in the urao world or how the urao see this festival in their culture hence what i am trying to look at the uh current festival from urao perspective which is miss missing in the uh, in the existing discourse and trying to reconfigure how this festival uh, performed by the urao doers actually help them to rearticulate their identity as an example the rituals of karam uh, it is celebrated on the 11th day after new moon in the month of bhado uh, during this festival there is a tradition of uh, storytelling um, in the earlier Uh, scholars or the uh, colonial ethnographers they have mainly focused on the mythological story uh, which narrates the story of karma and dharma karma or dharma on the other hand the historical story remains ignored the historical story actually tells the uh, migration of the urans from rohtasgarh it actually it it not only tells the story of their migration but it also uh, um, carries the history the unwritten history or in a, in another sense the alternative history of um urao of uh, the great urao female warrior singidai who fought against the cheros um along with the urao women folk so this is how uh, the focus has shifted in the one part while the other part remain missing or remain ignored so this narration of the karam story is a ritual itself it encompasses with its within the system of narrativeization of urao history tradition customs rituals and identity the karam festival from this moment onwards stops being an ordinary festival it becomes a performance a ritual 
a means of understanding and emphasizing the issue of identity, which is at the core of celebration and observance. I would like to share um, another instances of a festival called the Fago Festival. Um, here it is celebrated on the day in which uh, Holi or the Holi Kadehan is performed. However, the it, it sometimes mixed with the idea of the Holi Kadahan, although the philosophy behind this festival is very different uh, from the Holi Kadahan. Uh, this assumption has been based, made on the basis of the similarity that this is celebrated on the actual date. So the post-colonial scholars or the ethnographers, they have described this festival in their writings, but the problem comes when um, this festival has been represented as a kind of, as a part of Hindu festival. Although the philosophy of this festival among the Orang is very different. This festival is not limited within uh, one particular day, but it is much more than the celebration because there are certain rituals which is uh, there, which is celebrated along with this festival, such as Danda Katta. In, in this ritual, the entire creation myth is being enacted in which uh, the creation myth, according to the Urams, is being enacted. And there are also certain other rituals associated with this festival, like Fagu Sendra, or this is known as the Fagu, uh, Fagu hunting. Hunting was one of the uh, feature of this Adivasi community. But uh, now, uh, due to this, uh, the uh, acts like uh, um, the Forest Act, which has prevented them from this uh, performing this uh, rituals. But still, um, they are trying to continue this uh, um, ritual by doing this Fagu Sendra or this hunting in a very symbolic way. They do this hunting at village level with uh, some domestic uh, uh, animals. But still, they are trying to perform this uh, uh, rituals. Another important aspect of this Fagu is the Janisikar, in which the Ura women used to dress up like a man uh, carrying bows and arrow arrows in the earlier days and they used to visit uh, the nearby forest to hunt the wild animals. So this part of this festival has not been addressed by the earlier scholars. It is only interpreted as a part of Hindu festival called Holi Kadahan or Holi. So Ultimately, this is how this festival is being misrepresented in the existing scholarship of colonial ethnographies and, and to, to some extent, even in the post-colonial ethnographies. Uh, in the similar way, there is also another festival called Sohrai festival, which is celebrated during the um, during uh, Diwali, at the same time during the Amavas. Um, this festival has also altogether a different philosophy. This festival is purely dedicated for the cattle wealth. This festival is dedicated, uh, dedicated, or uh, the Urang celebrate to pay tribute to the cattle, which assist them throughout the year in their agricultural uh, activities. Uh, <clears throat> for the one day, they worship cows. They, in fact, uh, perform the entire worship, um, worshiping rituals in the cow shed, and even they eat on that day uh, in the cow shed. They wear some. They provide some foods to the. Uh, cattle and they eat in the same cattle said. So these are uh, four festivals celebrated by the Urals and this uh, these festivals are uh, some sort of a medium through which they try to connect themselves with their roots and uh, they try to find out a sense of belongingness to a, a wider Urang community all over, um, all over the country. So ritual and festival performance creates a powerful effect that can influence the understanding of people their festival as a performance and as a part of culture become a site for producing knowledge and discourse among Urang community. The traditional knowledge of the festival and ritual has been passed on for generation among the Urang, among the Urangs orally as well as through bodily enactments. The festival performance expresses uh, the cultural identity of the Urang. One of the purposes for participation in the festival is social interaction. A festival strengthens the identity and uh, as it brings the groups together and i would like to conclude my presentation with uh, the argument given by clifford gage he says that the masses of festival reflect shared experiences of the group it, it communicates about particular society while telling a story that people tell themselves about themselves thank you 
Thank you so much, sir, for your very interesting and insightful observation. Now, as uh, we can look at the time, Dr. Uh, Professor Apurbo Shahar couldn't make it due to some unavoidable circumstances. So we will now move on to the question and answer session. Uh, the first question is for Dr. Shorov Banerjee. Sir, since you have a special interest in Australian literature, please share your observation on how art can be a tool for challenging and dismantling stereotypes about Australian tribal communities. Uh, I, I think it is very clear from the, the, uh, the talk of the three panelists, me included, that uh, uh, there, is a, there is a kind of a, a process which we may say that uh, uh, just like uh, Professor uh, Topo had said, that they, these Adivasis were considered to be outside the, the realm of civilization, regularly interacting, clashing rather, with civilization. So there is this, there's this concept of what we call defamiliarize, dehumanize, and demonize. So first you defamiliarize them, that they are not like us. Then you dehumanize them, that is, they are not proper human beings. Then you kind of demonize them, so it is it becomes easy for you to kind of... Uh, Pass off anything that you, any atrocity that you do to them, uh, like say, in if you're talking about Australia, the land was actually not terra nullis. It was it was declared terra nullis, that is no man's land. And then by the Mabo trial, it was declared that no court court reverted that order that no, it is not. It was not free land that the Europeans came and uh, kind of conquered. The Aboriginals had been living there for many many years. So there's always this kind of a a, a kind of politics going on. So. In the continent of Australia, this land was inhabited by the indigenous Australians for about 50,000 years before the first European settlement in the continent, which happened in 1788 with the first fleet sailing there. Now, uh, the language these people spoke, they were not one community of tribes, there were so many communities. The language itself would have been classified into roughly 250 groups. But the problem is, I think one of my panelists also mentioned that there is not enough recorded history, it is mostly older history of all these. And therefore, the records of the period are popularly termed as prehistory of Australia. They are not in the mainstreams. So whatever uh, little we know about Australia, Australia is mostly the history of Australia after it was spotted and uh, colonized by the Europeans. And therefore, it is, it is kind of a no mean task to understand what Australia is, what the, uh, the tribals in Australia were, and how they functioned. But uh, since you've asked me about how uh, art is a form of resistance in, in Australia now, so what I'll, I'll just talk about uh, very uh, shortly about the contemporary indigenous Australian art, also known as the contemporary Aboriginal Australian art. And it is the modern artwork produced by indigenous Australians, that is Aboriginal Australians and uh, Torres Strait Islander people. It is generally regarded uh, as having its beginning in, the 19, in 1971 with a painting movement that started in the northwest of Alice Springs, Northern Territory, uh, involving Aboriginal artists such as Clifford uh, Possum and facilitated by a white Australian teacher, a white Australian teacher and art uh, worker called Jeffrey uh, Brandon. Now, what this does is what did this was that it, it, it opened up the avenues of Australian Aboriginals for showcasing and showing the whole world their culture. It, it's, it's a kind of, it, it is not a kind of protest, but it's a kind of representation. It's a kind of fighting back for their own identity. Now, uh, Professor of Art History. Ian McLean described the birth of this contemporary indigenous art movement in the 1970s as, I, I quote, the most fabulous moment in Australian art history and considered that it was becoming one of Australia's founding myths like the Anzac spirit. Anzac spirit of the Australia and New Zealand, uh, the army corps. Art historian Wally uh, Corona uh, called this indigenous art as the last great tradition of art to be appreciated by the world at large and, uh, and contemporary Indigenous art is the only art movement of international significance to emerge from Australia. Now, leading critics have also termed this as the last great art movement of the 20th century. And, and some people have also uh, termed this as Australia's equivalent of jazz. So what jazz music to the world, Australian, this movement is to the world of art. So this is how uh, in the contemporary world, I'd say that Australian art is kind of coming out of uh, getting their tribes from being stereotyped and misrepresented. If that answers your question. Great answer, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, now I would like to ask this uh, next question to Dr. Amit Soni. 
sir in the sec uh, in the context of your article titled socio cultural lifestyle of tri natives gond bhil and shanthal are there specific themes or aspects of the socio cultural lifestyle of these tribes that are frequently overlooked or inaccurately depicted in art and how can this be addressed yeah <clears throat> why these uh, first of all i must say that uh, as i uh, told in my uh, earlier thing also earlier talk also that these are tri natives because gond bhil and santhal these are the three major tribal groups of india residing in the central province or central india and they share some kind of similarity in their culture though they have their cultural differentiation but some kind of common things also in their culture now uh, and three of these tribes come in a very huge tribes or quite uh, developed tribes but in few instances these tribes were not depicted actually by the colonial period somehow because these tribal tribes were very uh, um, i mean big tribes i first of all i must take the case of gonds here gond uh, was not actually a very backward tribe at that time you, you might have heard about the gond dynasty you might have heard about the gond dynasty so it was a dynasty it was a big uh, means a very huge population living in the central area though it was they have their dynasty in the forested area of the central india but they were shown quite different and they were segregated from the main stream uh, caste communities by the our colonizers british colonizers and they were depicted separately as a tribal group they created this new identity here but actually the tribals and non tribals were living with uh, living uh, very harmoniously harmoniously in the ancient ancient period also and right? why they have did thing this thing was quite uh, maybe their administrative trick or something else but uh, means because earlier what we were not calling them scheduled tribe or a tribal group we were just calling them gond bhil or santhal like any other group any other caste community group so they were depicted in a very similar uh, fashion also there they were they were depicted in a very similar way they are with the similar stage they were depicted i means like a smaller dynasty or bigger dynasty they were depicted in that same fashion in the their cultural scenario also in their relationship with uh, other communities also because the neighboring groups were working for the gonds as their service groups as the baga were working uh, for the gonds as a uh, their medicine men and also as their priest local priest also though the pradhan gonds or the pathari gonds were also working uh, for the gond communities as priest but and the neighboring uh, you can say uh, panika panikas were working for the gonds as their weavers and these were given equal opportunities or equal uh, means you can say somehow equal labor uh, respect by the gonds also even in the gond forts the gond forts there were they were involved as the courtiers means one baga courtiers one panika courtier so in this way in their art form also in their dance in their songs in their myths in their legends all these mentions of the neighboring communities also come hai na so in this way they were quite united they were quite connected though they were having some distinct a uh, little bit distinct cultural background that's why they were considered as a different group otherwise they were also having similar characteristics so that's what i wanted to show means how what was their lifestyle and how it has changed today how they are projected today in through my art this article was uh, actually published in a uh, in the journal indian uh, indian journal of research in anthropology and uh, means i am uh, currently currently i am uh, holding the editor in chief post for that journal also great sir thank you so much for this uh, very interesting answer
uh, I would now uh, uh, ask the next question to Professor Pawan Toppo. Uh, so, what are the key festivals celebrated by the Adivasi and the Oran tribes, and how through designs, motifs, or symbols, their spiritual and cultural beliefs are reflected? Uh, sir, would you please uh, unmute yourself? You're muted. Okay. Uh, in fact, I have discussed all those things, but I would be I would like to summarize the entire thing. That the main the major festivals celebrated by the Ura communities are uh, Sarhul, Karam, Sohrai, and Fagu. These are the primary festivals, and apart from this. Uh, festivals, there are also certain other festivals which are connected with the um, agriculture, like Dhan Buni, Haryari, Bangari, Kadleta, Nawakhani. These are the festivals which are connected with the um, peri transplantation. The, these festivals or these rituals has, um, is performed with the passage of the time when the peri is being transplanted uh, in the field. Now, uh, to respond to the next part of the question, like the Sarhul festival reflects their eco-conscious belief system of the Urals, how they, they are so much conscious about uh, the natural balance. And this festival is basically dedicated um, towards nature. And it reflects that the humans and the nature, it shares a symbiotic relationship. So these particular festivals uh, represents a respect towards nature and uh, what we should do to protect or preserve the nature. Uh, in a similar fashion, and there is another festival called Karam festival, which also centers around the trees. One of the interesting factor is that most of those festivals is uh, the festival is not something that is dedicated towards any particular gods or deities. These festivals are actually celebrated uh, in form of worshiping the nature. I'm giving just two examples. Sarhul is uh, also cel uh, celebrated around uh, Sarhul tree, which is the Sal tree. In a similar way, Karam festival is celebrated centering around a tree called Karam tree. And there is a mythical story behind the celebration. But ult um, the ultimate point is that they are worshipping a tree, uh, which they consider as their savior. In the similar way, uh, this festival called uh, Sohrai festival, which they celebrate uh, as a kind of a tribute, paying tribute to the uh, to the cattle. So this is how they are they represent their belief system, uh, eco-conscious belief system towards nature and all the natural organisms and uh, as well as the animals. I hope I have answered your question. Sure, sir. Thank you so much for uh, this explanation. Uh, I would, I think uh, this brings us to the end of today's session. I thank all the panelists once again for sharing their invaluable perspective on the topic. This is to remind that we are calling for submissions on tribal art and tribal representation in art, the details of which can be viewed on www.tellmeyourstory.biz. We will come back to you soon with our next panel discussion on the project. Till then, good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a lovely panel.